Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 11 for November the 13th, 2016. We're still in Unit 3 entitled Alpha and Omega. Our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is Eternal Beauty. The devotional reading is taken from Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 28 and uh, Genesis chapter 2 verse 3. Our background scripture is taken from Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 through 27. Our print passage today is taken from Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 through 14 and verses 22 through 27. Our key verse reads, John wrote, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to explore the possibility of living in a new place, even in another dimension of life. The second aim is to imagine the richness and serenity of living in the New Jerusalem and thirdly uh, to celebrate God's provision of a new place for believers at the end of all things temporal and throughout eternity. We have three outlines today that we will be discussing. Uh, the first outline is entitled, Oh What a Beautiful City. The second outline is, is entitled, An Eternal Temple. And the third outline is entitled, A Place for All. I am grateful today and thankful to God for this privilege to be able to share this lesson with you and hopefully to encourage you uh, to look beyond this life, the cares of this life, to look to the promises uh, that uh, God has laid out in great detail um, for all of us to believe and to have hope. Uh, if we're going to live in this life, we need to live in hope, confident expectation that God will fulfill everything that he has promised to do. We started uh, in Unit 3 on last Sunday uh, we hope that uh, many of you were able to follow along with us. We were uh, beginning our discussion from the book of Revelation, not Revelations. Uh, it's just the book of Revelation. There is no S. Uh, we began in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And we continue in the 21st chapter of Revelation today. Um, this discussion concerning eternal beauty. But before we get into these outlines, I want to back up just a little bit to uh, some principles of this book. There are various cycles uh, of the book of Revelation, uh, some seven cycles, uh, different topics. And it's important to understand where you are uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, which cycle you are looking at, uh, that you may gain some understanding but in the very first chapter of the book of Revelation I want to just introduce this book uh, to us and how we got uh, to this this revelation the Bible says Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things uh, which must shortly take place and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John who bore witness uh, to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw and then verse 3 says blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So God makes um, a thorough provision for the communication process. Uh, the message originates with God the Father. 
is given to Jesus Christ and is made known to John through an angel. John testifies by writing and all are encouraged to read and hear. Revelation stresses that though it comes in symbolic form it is understandable. It is revelation disclosing rather than hiding truth. It is for his servants not a special elite. God expects Christians to keep those things which are written and to profit spiritually and then a blessing encourages people to read and hear. So we want to just uh, lay a foundation for this book and, and the purpose of it. Uh, it should also be understood that uh, Christians uh, were being uh, persecuted um, at this time uh, and this uh, prophecy uh, was given to uh, John to to write and to encourage the hearers uh, and that's very important uh, so the major point is that Satan will finally be defeated and that even before that time God takes care of his saints and blesses them uh, through his triumphant rule this assurance ought to comfort Christians uh, whatever their uh, millennial position is then that goes back to the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation uh, the millennial reign of Christ and we understand that there are various viewpoints uh, concerning the millennial reign of Christ uh, in part due to the interpretation of um, the Old Testament passages but we want to begin today uh, want to back in the 21st chapter the book of Revelation uh, verses 9 through 14 and uh, I want to read this um, from the NIV translation one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me come and I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb and he carried me away in the spirit uh, to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God it shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel like a jasper clear as crystal it had a great high wall with twelve gates uh, with twelve angels at the gates on the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel uh, there were three gates on the east three on the north three on the south and three on the west verse 14 the wall of the city had twelve foundations and on them uh, were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. I want to read a little bit um, uh, of this context uh, before we go into some of the commentary so we can get a, a better understanding. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 closes with all the sinners of the ages. Satan the beasts and the false prophets having been cast into the lake of fire forever. Chapter 21 opens with John seeing a vision of a new heaven and a new earth following the destruction of the entire universe and its cleansing from sin. I want you to look at Second Peter chapter 3 verses 10 through 13. God will replace the old creation with a new and eternal one characterized by the absence of the sea uh, thought to symbolically represent either a new and different climactic condition or the removal of any barriers that separate God and his people he also saw the eternal dwelling place of all the saints the new Jerusalem descending into this new universe metaphorically it is described as a bride adorned for her husband 
You know, as I was reading this and I began to think about uh, back in the Old Testament, uh, one of the main principles that we learn from the Old Testament is that God always wanted to be with his people. He always wanted to be in close fellowship with them. Um, and, and, and as we look at the book of Revelation, we see God bringing about uh, this new creation, uh, this new city where he can dwell uh, with his people uh, eternally not a temporal basis but an eternal basis uh, John saw this city uh, the angel of God showed it to him uh, to encourage him you recall John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos uh, for his faith um, and the Bible says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And, and God began to show John various things about the future. And John is not psychic. John is recounting and has put in great detail everything that he saw. And you know, uh, it's very important. Uh, this is the hope uh, that I was talking about earlier that we live in what we understand that we live in confident expectation of what God has said uh, he would do but here the best and most accurate description of heaven is in God's word specifically Revelation chapter 21 John was directed by one of the angels in his vision to come and see the bride of Christ this angel was the one who had shown him Babylon, the great harlot, and then showed him the new Jerusalem uh, in verse 10. Beginning with verse 11, John gave a detailed description of the beauty uh, of this new city of God. This description was given in human terms to accentuate the city's beauty in a, in a manner that his readers could understand. And you know, God does that he allows us to to discern he allows us to see things and and sometimes he tells us things uh, that help us and he puts it on our level uh, that we can understand uh, the purpose uh, of his fellowship and the purpose of his promise and and those of us that have read this story this prophecy in the book of Revelation there's no reason why you should be living in despair not that we don't uh, become discouraged in this life, but overall we're living according to the promises and we are standing on the promises of God. Things that he said, and I love this, God says he's going to do it. Uh, you recall back over in the 14th chapter of the book of uh, John when Jesus was uh, uh, talking to his disciples uh, about him leaving them. Uh, and they began to uh, get upset in the upper room discourse and 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 Jesus told them to let not your heart be troubled he said believe in God believe also in me and he went on to tell them that in his father's house were many mansions and if it were not so he would not have told them that but he says I go away to prepare a place and we are reading about that place today in Revelation chapter 1. And then Jesus told his disciples that if he go away, he would come again. Now that's a promise. That's, a, that's expectation. That should put, uh, and I'm sure it did the disciples at that time, and it should put us in a state of confident expectation that God will, uh, Christ will come again. Just as he said. But this place, uh, John uh, gets a glimpse of it. Uh, the city would have the glory of God or God himself living in her midst. No lights were needed because the city would radiate with God's glory. Brilliance like the jewel, jasper, clear as crystal. In this city, there will be no darkness or night. 
symbolic of the absence of sin and evil. And I, I love that about God. And we are as Christians and even the whole world at large. We are plagued by sin and evil. But God has uh, 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 developed a plan and a promise to do away with it. Uh, that we might be encouraged. Verses 12 and 13 describe the wall of the city. Just as ancient cities had walls for security and protection. The new Jerusalem will have a great high wall symbolic of security and the exclusion of anything ungodly. John saw twelve gates, three on each side of the city, with twelve angels stationed at each, another representation of security. The names of the twelve tribes of Israel were inscribed on these gates in order to, of their encampment around the tabernacle. The city's twelve huge foundation stones were inscribed with the names of the twelve apostles, suggesting that the church rests on the foundation of the apostles. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 20 uh, and 21. And I think we'll go over there uh, and we'll read that because it's important to understand that when the apostles uh, began to minister uh, the things that God gave them uh, through Jesus Christ. This laid a foundation for the truth, a foundation uh, for what God wants us to be standing on. It's nothing but the truth. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to go over to uh, verse 20. The Bible says, well, let's go up to verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. If in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That is a beautiful passage. Did you know that you are being built into a, a holy dwelling place for God himself? Don't you know that God is still working on us and working in us uh, because no sin uh, no ungodly thing can enter into this city and, and we have to be mindful of the Holy Spirit uh, that he is making changes uh, in our lives to suit where we are going. Uh, that's very important to understand. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 Paul says I'm confident of this very thing that he that began a good work in you will perform it or perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this work that is going on in your life and in my life and, and how God is rearranging and arranging us and, and cleansing us it is because we have some place to go. It is because God intends for you to be where he is and it's because God wants no sin to be in his presence so thank God for the suffering thank God for the cleansing because suffering has a way of causing us in many cases to cease from sin to stop doing the thing so uh, 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 God allows things to come up on us to buffet us if you will to keep us from being the opposite this is what the apostle Paul talked about uh, the thorn that was in his flesh that was given to him according to scripture Paul uh, God didn't want Paul to develop a spirit of pride and so this thorn if you will was given to him to keep him where God wanted him to be and we have to be mindful of that some things that we're going through now it's best that we go through these things because we have some place to go and God wants us to be uh, cleansed of all of our unrighteous righteousness this is a beautiful passage to understand uh, and keep in mind this is why this uh, a prophecy was given that we may be able to understand. The question is asked in the quarterly, what are some of the conceptions that believers past and 
present have about uh, the appearance of heaven and I know that you have uh, as I have heard a lot of things uh, about people's viewpoints uh, about when they get over there and what they're going to be doing and make sure anything that you're saying that you're going to do where God is is scripture based because a lot of these things are not based on anything that's in the word of God and so we have to keep in mind that 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 God is reading and is going to read us uh, and that is an active process of all of our unrighteousness so be just be biblically based uh, in your viewpoints concerning uh, heaven and what God has prepared for those who love him the second outline is entitled an eternal temple this is taken from Revelation chapter 21 verses 22 and 23 again from the NIV translation I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple verse 23 the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp this is beautiful initially the tabernacle and later the temple represented God's presence among his chosen people Israel so important and meaningful was the fact that even when one could not physically get to the temple praying in its direction was deemed appropriate and a beneficial uh, part uh, to the worshiper this truth also led to the false assurance that as long as the temple stood no disaster would come to Jerusalem this was proven erroneous when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians ancient cities would have one or more temples where their various gods would be worshipped uh, John saw uh, an unusual phenomenon in this vision of the new Jerusalem there was no temple this is because God himself and the Lamb will be the temple the presence of God will be among his people and will permeate the entire city permanently can you imagine the unspeakable joy of eternally basking in the presence of God and enjoying unhindered worship? The thought of there being no temple except God and the Lamb is further illustrated in verse 23. One commentator summarized it this way, God will be the light of the new Jerusalem. The statement God is light means that the city will be enveloped by God who is perfectly holy and true just as darkness uh, cannot exist in the presence of light so sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God I want you to read Psalm number one uh, because there's some uh, uh, lessons over there that we can learn concerning what God is saying about uh, unrighteousness and and ungodliness in his presence uh, so the city uh, will be completely without sin and evil uh, believers today must be consistently reminded that they cannot worship God uh, here for our temples are tainted uh, with any form of sin. The hope of being in, the, in his presence in the New Jerusalem requires that we strive uh, to walk in the light of his word now because no sin will be allowed in his presence. I want to go very quickly over to Psalm uh, 119, uh, a very familiar passage of scripture to us, uh, Psalm 119, and I want to go down to verse 9. The Bible says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Verse 10. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's very important. We keep our way pure by adhering to the word of God. Not just believing it, but obeying it. And then we're able to rid our lives of, of many of the pitfalls that, excuse me, that cause us to 
stray away uh, from the faith. I, I recall the Apostle Paul uh, talking to Timothy about that very thing that many have wandered away from the faith uh, um, and have become shipwrecked and sometimes that happens to us when we don't keep our focus on the Word of God uh, we drift away and we don't want to be uh, uh, or have stumbling blocks uh, in our path uh, because as it says here we need to strive uh, and this is not a work I, 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 I wanted to make that clear uh, I won't go over there but I want you to read Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 uh, this is this is what we should be doing uh, when we cooperate with the Spirit of God and we walk accordingly uh, we are doing what we supposed to do uh, we're not we're not earning anything uh, in this striving and we should not be alone in the process but many times I can share this with you that I pray the prayer God help me with myself because we do need that help from him to help us uh, keep our paths clear that path of faith that causes us to wander off sometimes uh, the question is asked here in the quarterly what are some specific actions and attitudes that are required from us that we may come into God's presence to worship him and so that's what we said earlier uh, that we need to have the right attitude in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 will help us understand that uh, a little bit better as we present our bodies as living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto God our last outline is entitled a place for all this is taken from Revelation chapter 21 uh, verses 24 through 27 again from the NIV translation the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it on no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there verse 26 the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it verse 27 nothing impure will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. I hope we understand this. Uh, there's so much uh, uh, messages uh, going out today, uh, especially in the church, uh, and we have uh, not adhered to the doctrinal uh, uh, teachings of, of, of the fact that God is holy. Uh, we, we should never ever forget that part about the character of God because it says here nothing impure uh, will ever enter it. Uh, and those of us that believe that, that it's okay for us to habitually sin, I just want you to know you're not supported by scripture in that thought process. Uh, I just want you to know that there is no way scripturally that God can tolerate sin. Uh, I want you to know that James chapter 1 tells us that let no one say that when he is tempted that he is being tempted by God. It goes on to say that God for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. So let us be clear not to put God's name on sin. He cannot by nature, he cannot, according to the scripture, be associated with sin. The only association that God will have with a sinner and sin is to cleanse him of that. The first epistle of John, chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9, tells us, If any man say he does not have a fault, he is a lie, and the truth is not in him. And what God does when we confess our sins the Bible say he is faithful and he is just to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness so that is God's role if you will in, in, in terms of uh, 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 associating with a sinner uh, and, and, and sin is to cleanse us from these things 
and and that is a distinct act of the Holy Spirit uh, to keep us clean uh, keep in mind as we said earlier we have some place to go uh, eternally we have an eternal destination and God would not go through all of this trouble of, of developing and creating a new city and then allow sin to come into that city like he created this world uh, uh, the, uh, as, as Genesis tells us and the beautiful garden of Eden and sin got in uh, uh, through Adam and Eve why would God create a new city and allow sin to come in uh, he could be best suited just to keep the world that we have that is full of sin and I, I love the scripture because it makes good sense to me and I hope that I am making good sense to you but persons of color are well aware of being denied access to places because of our ethnicity. Even if we are allowed access, it too was restricted to back entrances and back seats. Today, there are clubs with restricted memberships and gated residential areas where entrance is denied to certain groups. John described for us a scene that is the antithesis of these realities on earth today. He reported that in this new Jerusalem, all of God's people will be welcomed into it. The redeemed from every nation and ethnicity will be able to live in heaven's light, God's presence in unrestricted fellowship with God. Kings of the earth will divest themselves of their crowns and of glory and bring their splendor to God. The fact that the city's gates will never be shut because of the absence of night refers to the eradication of evil. So we, we go back to this this uh, uh, theme, if you will, about God removing sin and evil. It cannot, it will not uh, 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 be in the presence of God. God will not be in fellowship with sin. He will not be in fellowship with evil. He will not participate. He doesn't want it in his presence. Uh, he doesn't want it in his city. He doesn't want it on his people. He has rejected it. And we have to understand that because Jesus came and paid the sin debt. So why would he die, have to die, shed his innocent sinless blood on Calvary for our sins if God wanted that in his presence why not just leave Jesus in heaven and not send him uh, to die for something that he's going to participate in again it doesn't make sense so we have to be careful that we understand these things clearly don't be deceived God is not mocked whatever man soweth that shall he also reap you'll find that in Galatians chapter 6 it goes on to say nations that were blessed with glory and honor will be represented in the city there will be nothing unclean in this city this statement does not mean that evil uh, was present was still present outside the city but should be taken as God's warning his readers that they uh, would not be able to enjoy God's presence if their names were not found uh, in the Lamb's book of life as the old church would say you better get right now if you want to see Jesus in heaven only the righteous uh, will see God that's very important Jesus said these words to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John you must be you must be born again if you're not you won't even see this you won't get close to this that John is describing here that God has created. I want to go quickly over to the uh, first epistle of John. I believe we want to go over to chapter 2. And we want to go down to uh, verse 3 through verse 6. The first epistle of John chapter 2 verse 3. Uh, the Bible says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says, um, 
he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now this is the test of knowing him, knowing Jesus Christ. We ought to walk as he walked. We ought to live, in other words, as he lived. So if we say we are abiding in him or we are of him and that we are his children, we are admonished today to walk as he walked keep our path uh, clear through the power of the Holy Spirit and certainly through indoctrination. We need to know the Word of God for ourselves. We need to know what God requires of us uh, uh, in His Word so we can live this thing uh, uh, if we expect to be with God. And this is the test for us in life today uh, is to stay the course uh, that, that has been set before us through Jesus Christ. Uh, so I hope that uh, you have been encouraged by all of this uh, from the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. I hope that you will go back and read all of it. And remember, God wants us to remain hopeful in the face of adversity and persecution, suffering and the like. Jesus says in the 16th chapter of John, in this life you will have tribulations and trial, but be of good cheer. Jesus says, for I have overcome the world. So we want you to be encouraged today. Just know that, that God loves you, uh, and I do too. I really appreciate God being able to uh, give us his word and, and allow me to be able to share it with you. Uh, and so we hope that uh, God will bless us to come together again, that we may be encouraged by one another's faith. Our closing prayer. Father, thank you for preparing a place of beauty for us to dwell in where uh, we will enjoy your presence forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, we thank and praise God for you. And until such time that the Lord will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.